So I did a video a while back about what happens to your investments and pensions if you were to leave the UK. But what if you're moving into the UK? What are some of the things you need to know and do to get set up? Although I am British born, I have experienced and helped a few friends and family members move over to the UK to help them get to grips with navigating what needs to be done in the first few days when they move over, which are the most confusing. A lot of these aspects are intertwined, so hopefully what you'll get from this video is a good guidance of what you should aim to do and what order you should do them in. So without further ado, I'm Cosan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. Before we start, I do want to clarify that this is not going to be a video about how to obtain the rights to live and work in the UK. There are so many countries and so many variables, especially now that we have left the European Union, that it's just something I cannot cover. But if you are looking for information on that, then be sure to check out the government website and I'll put a link in the description box down below. Once that part has done, then this is where my guideline becomes useful. I talk you through what you should do before and after you arrive. Obviously, everything may not apply to you, but this is just a rough guideline. Let's start off with things you should do before you arrive. First up is do your research, which I guess is what you're kind of doing because you are watching this video. So be sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to learn more about personal finance here in the UK. But yes, it is really important that you do as much research ahead of your departure as possible. Areas you should focus on is to get a general understanding of where you would like to live, whether it be like a city or rural area, what kind of job you're looking for and if the area you're moving to is best suited for your field. If you already have a job, get an understanding of the transportation links perhaps, prices for accommodation and prices for general outgoings like food, transportation, bills, etc, etc. In the description box down below, there is a link to a website called Homelet and they have something called a rental index. And the last one was actually carried out in February 2022 and it breaks down the average rental price by UK area. So it should give you an idea of what you can expect from a rental perspective. Another thing to do before you depart is to make sure you have a way to access some funds to at least cover for the first month of when you arrive. This will give you the ability to pay for accommodation, food and transport before you sort out more permanent options such as setting up a UK bank account, finding a job and a permanent place to live. It's good to have access to a mix of both cash and card. Cash is great because it will limit the amount of fees and taxes that are quite common with overseas bank transfers but a card will also be useful because A, you're not carrying loads of money, and B, certain places may require you to do online bookings, which may restrict you to using a card only. So it is best to have both options available to you. And lastly, before you arrive to the UK, make sure you have somewhere already booked for you to stay. Options can include things like staying at a friend's and family's place, Airbnb, hostels, and hotels. If you are fortunate to have friends and family over here to host you, then I would say this would probably be the easiest option as this will probably be the most cost efficient option as well as they can also help you with getting set up in some other steps that I'll talk through in this guide as well. So that'll be really, really useful. Otherwise, accommodation like Airbnb, hostels and hotels are great options too. I would suggest having an initial booking of about two to three weeks and see if you can ask in advance if there's any flexibility to extend your stay should you need to. So those are the key things to ensure that you have covered before you arrive. Now let's move on to what to do when you arrive and I'm calling this day one. And what I mean by that is that you should aim to have the following completed by the end of the very next day. Pro tip is that if you can help it, try not let your day one fall on a Sunday. You can of course get some of the stuff done, but our shops typically have shorter opening hours and most of our banks don't operate on a Sunday too. And if they are open, it is for limited hours. So for an easier ride, um, I would suggest try not letting your day one fall on a Sunday. Cool, so first up for day one is to get a SIM card. Now this should be relatively straightforward. Now because you haven't got any means of regular payment via UK bank account yet, as an interim measure, you can buy a pay-as-you-go SIM. It's quite easy to do. You just go to any major supermarket or even a convenience shop we actually call these shops off licenses and they usually sell these SIM cards near the counter. Do make sure that your phone does allow for different SIM cards, otherwise you may need to get your phone unlocked or buy another phone that does accept different SIM cards. Getting a UK phone number on day one will prove really useful as setting up accounts do require your contact details to be used and it helps when you are also applying for a job. Once you are more settled in, you can decide to ditch your pay-as-you-go SIM 
and go for a monthly contract instead, which does tend to be a lot more affordable in the long run. Next up is to open up a UK bank account. Now this one can actually prove to be a bit of an annoyance, especially if you don't have any proof of address or even a permanent address for that matter. So you may find yourself in some kind of weird loop as usually to get a proof of address letter in the form of a bill, you would need a bank account. But to get a bank account, you need a proof of address letter. So it's a bit of a chicken egg situation. Now, for most cases, getting the bank account sorted first will be quicker and easier. You can actually do this ahead of your arrival. You can contact our banks, letting them know that you would like to open up an overseas account, but this usually comes with a charge. Alternatively, you can contact your current bank to see if they have any partnerships with any UK banks here, and it might make it easier for you to open one before you arrive. Otherwise, if you do not have a proof of address, then digital banks are probably your best bet, and you can open one in a matter of minutes. A few examples are Starling Bank, Revolut, Moneys, and Monzo. Now these are only a few suggestions, and they normally, and I say normally in quotes, do not ask for proof of address, but this can change depending on your circumstance. Otherwise, another option is that you can actually spend some time contacting or walking in store to our retail banks and inquire there, my flatmate who moved from Italy a few years ago managed to open up a HSBC UK account without having the need for a proof of address. Whether HSBC will let you still do that, I'm not too sure because it was a few years ago and the rules behind whether you need one or not does seem a bit convoluted. But yeah, at the end of the day, you should manage to find a way to open up an account. And because it can prove difficult in certain circumstances, that's why it's really important that we tackle this issue on day one. If anyone else knows of any other tips or advice, feel free to share your wisdom in the comment section down below. Now, to open up a bank account in the UK, you will likely be asked to provide some form of evidence, such as passport or a valid photo ID, a recent utility bill, a recent bank or credit card statement, proof of studying in the UK if you are applying for a student account, and in some cases, some banks may ask for proof of employment. Now, the last thing to do on day one is to make sure you book and, if available, attend a national insurance appointment as soon as possible. This is needed so you can register with national insurance and obtain something called a national insurance number or NI number for short. National insurance is a tax on your earnings or if you're self-employed, it will be on your profits and it is used towards funding state benefits here in the UK, such as the state pension, sick pay, maternity leave, etc, etc. You will ultimately need a national insurance number to work here in the UK. Once you have attended your booked appointment, it can take a few weeks to get your national insurance number. So that is why I suggest to have this as your day one requirement and make sure we get this done as soon as possible. It is possible for you to start work without having your NI number, but be sure to keep your employer informed and let them know that you have applied and you're just waiting on a response. If you are self-employed, be sure to keep HMRC informed throughout the entire process. To be eligible for a national insurance number, you need to have the rights to live and work in the UK. And I'll put a link in the description box down below on how you can apply. Plus it provides some more information on any key documentations you need to bring to your appointment. Now moving on to day two. So now you've got your mobile number and a bank account sorted and you've booked your NI appointment. It's time to start the following on day two. Now these steps will take some time to complete. So when I do say day two, I don't expect them to be done in one day. It's just that at least the process should be started on day two. So first up is to look for a job. If you haven't got employment already sorted, then now you have all the necessary details to start looking for a role. Uh, you can create a CV or a resume if you haven't already got one and start sending them online or in person. Now in this country it is a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to how employers accept applications. For large corporations to get a job, you normally would need to apply through an online portal that they've got set up. But for smaller businesses like an independent retail store or a restaurant, they are likely to accept CVs in person. So you'll need to actually physically visit the stores to do so. For more specialist roles, then almost 100% of the time you would need to apply online or go via a recruiter. I'll put some links down below on some template ideas, job boards and recruiters to help you get started. Again, if you haven't managed to get your NI number sorted at this point, don't worry. Turning a job around can take a long time, especially depending on which field you're in. So it is still worth applying whilst you wait. And if the question does ever come up, be sure to let them know at any given opportunity that you have at least had your appointment and you're just waiting on getting your NI number. We also have some very strict labor laws and rights, which depict things like the minimum amount of holidays you can get and the national minimum wage. I'll pop a link in the description box down below so you can familiarize yourself 
of what to expect. I feel like there's going to be a lot of links in the description box, but hey, hopefully they're useful. Now, around about the same time as applying for roles, now is actually a good time to look for permanent accommodation. Again, if you haven't got one sorted already. Now, I will focus more on renting as I believe this is more likely to apply for the majority of you. But if you are indeed looking to buy, then be sure to check out my step by step guide on how to buy a house. I'll put a link in the cards right now. So for renting, the first thing to note is that once you have found a property you would like to move into, you usually need to make sure you have the funds to pay for an upfront deposit which is usually the equivalent of up to 1.5 times a month's rent. So for example, if you are applying for a place which is renting for £600 per month, you could expect the upfront deposit to be up to £900. And also you may potentially have to pay your first month's rent on top of this. So that will see your bill to come to £1,500. The deposit is normally a holding deposit, so you should get your money back once you decide to leave. This is of course, assuming you haven't broken anything, everything is clean when you leave, and you've stayed within the rules that the landlord has defined. But be sure to read the fine print before you sign anything. Otherwise, you may find that they may end up keeping the deposit or at least keep a proportion of the deposit. The amount of rent you will pay will, of course, depend on the type of property you would want, but also location plays a huge factor in this country as well. I've already mentioned at the beginning of my video the Home Let website, which has a rental index. So be sure to check that out to get a rough guide of what prices can look like depending on which area you're moving into. Cool, so that is all the urgent stuff out of the way. Now we can focus on some other key things that you should also do, but they aren't necessarily under any specific time constraints. So I'm calling this day three plus. Now the first one is that now that you have a UK bank account sorted, it might be worth transferring some money internationally to provide some additional short term finances. There are quite a few international money transfer options and the following are just a few companies to check out. The first one is Currency Fair, second we've got Moneycore, and third is Wise. You can also check out a website called Manito, and this is an online money transfer comparison tool which looks at the best deals that you can get for your specific transfer in real time by taking into account the amount that you want to transfer, the exchange rate, and the fees. Next up on the list is that once you have moved into a new property, you may need to sort out your bills. Now common utility bills in a household will consist of gas, electric, water, internet, and council tax. If you are renting, check with your landlord to see who the providers are, as it is likely that you are going to have to be responsible to let them know that you have moved in. If the providers haven't actually been set up or your landlord has given you permission to change the provider if you wish, then you can actually contact several different providers and get accounts set up with them. If you are gonna go through that route, then I would suggest you check out a website called Uswitch. They are one of the best comparison companies for all major utility bills. They have an online presence so you can do all your comparisons online but what I find more useful is that you just simply ring them up and have the operator do everything for you. They are super friendly, really helpful and convenient and in my opinion always seem to find me the best deals. For council tax you can wait for a letter to come through the post as the previous tenants should have informed them that they are leaving the property uh, or if that doesn't happen or it's taking a bit too long you can actually reach out to the councils yourselves and let them know that way. I'll put a link to a government website in the description box down below and this will tell you, depending on where you live, which council you need to speak to. Another thing to consider is that if you do have a private pension that you would like to bring to the UK, you may have the option to do so. Please note that the rules on this will range quite vastly depending on your provider, so it's probably worth speaking to both providers, the abroad one and your new UK provider to see if they can help you in some way to facilitate the transfer. They can then also advise you for any fees that, that will be included. And finally, one of the things you should also do when you move is to register with your GP. In the UK, we have the National Health Service or NHS, which is something that we are all very proud of. So it is worth signing up to your local doctor surgery or general practitioner surgery and applying can take a few days and weeks to get set up. And you wanna do that first. That way, when you actually do need to see someone, you don't have to go through the hassle of applying because you've already done it. Again, there'll be another link in the description box down below to help you find and register with a local GP. Cool, so that is it for this week's episode. Hopefully now you have some guidance on what to do once you have obtained the rights to live and work in the UK. Please do let me know if I have missed anything and if anyone has gone through something similar, it will be great for you to share your wisdom and some tips in the comment section down below. 
As always, if you did find this video really useful, I would appreciate if you smash that like button. That does wonders for the YouTube algorithm and the growth of my channel. And remember, I release a video every week, so if you want to keep up to date with those, hit the subscribe button too. See you later. Bye. 